Remember about a month ago at the NHL draft in Montreal that I had a source tell me that Ron Hextall was trying to acquire Jeff Petrie. And remember how when I reported that, it was like, oh, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. Dude's making it up, whatever. A week later, they end up getting Petrie. The source told me other stuff. And I'm going to share with you one of those items today. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates where you found this. The emphasis that everyone from Hextall down has placed on improving the Penguins' performance in front of their own net is unmistakable. It couldn't be more transparent, not just in their words, but also in their actions. Now, Petrie's not exactly the second coming of Chris Pronger, but he's a lot better in front of the net than Mike Matheson, and he's going to get out of the way and not have a bunch of goals go off his feet in the span of a single playoff series. Jan Ruta, another guy, really solid, a quiet defenseman, for lack of a better way to word it. That's why the Tampa Bay Lightning had him on the top pairing with Victor Hedman to allow Big 77 to do whatever it was that he wanted. It was a really, really smart maneuver, actually, by John Cooper, and it paid off. Now, those two guys aren't going to make the difference by themselves. There's no way that they can or that they should be expected to. And one could argue that the Penguins will actually get a little bit worse in this regard if, let's say, Brian Dumoulin were to be traded instead of Marcus Pedersen. So factor in, too, that this isn't over yet. But that wasn't what this source was discussing with me. Rather, it was about the technique, about the approach. For anybody who doesn't pay super crazy close attention to hockey, one of the things that's changed within the sport is the way you defend in front of your net. The old school way was... Get behind whoever dares to be anywhere near your crease and pound the living snot out of them. Use a stick if you have to, cross-check them across the back of the neck. Do anything and everything, but get them out of there. Now, the NHL claims to have put in a tighter standard on cross-checking, and apparently that memo made it to absolutely everybody in the league except Jacob Truba. So that might or might not have had an influence or just an added influence on this change. But over the past few years, you're seeing more and more defensemen front the forward instead of playing behind him. Now, I got to tell you, maybe it's just my own background in the game, but I hate this a lot. I hate that all of the onus then goes on the goaltender to see around Matthew Kachuk's butt or whoever it is that happens to be planted there. To me, that's a lousy thing to put on your most important player. But for the most part, that's not how the Penguins were doing it because of Mike Sullivan's emphasis on shot blocking and on just keeping the puck out of that area. Well, guess what? That didn't work against the Rangers. And maybe, just maybe, It'll look different this fall. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals. For those in need, visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. I don't know that this is going to happen. This source didn't know that it's going to happen. What the source did know is that it had been discussed, that maybe there's a different way the Penguins, as a team, as a collective, can handle their net front. So if you go and you get yourself a Jeff Petrie, a Jan Ruta, and by the way, I should throw in just parenthetically that the Penguins' draft was heavy on defensemen who are good in front of the net, not least of whom was the first rounder, Owen Pickering. They're years away, though. I'm just, that's just an oh, by the way. 
if the Penguins say, listen, way too many goals were scored against us right here in this blue paint or near the blue paint, whether it was the Ranger series, whether it was Chris Kreider, whether it was other teams that habitually crashed on them, and most teams did, whether it was from looking around at the rest of the league or the rest of the successful teams in the Stanley Cup playoffs and saying, we're going to try this a different way. I believe that you're at least going to hear an openness from Sullivan. And in turn, of course, Todd Reardon, his assistant, who's responsible for managing the defenseman, but is also influential in it. The decision is going to be Sullivan's, okay? And that, believe me, includes even if uh, Hextall or Brian Burke above him were to say, hey, that's enough of this. The head coach absolutely has to hold control of on-ice strategy. But the relationship that all of these gentlemen, all four of them that I just mentioned, have is such that they could sit down and talk this out, even if it got spirited or animated. They could talk this out and figure out what would be best based on the analytical information that they have. Now the Penguins are really stocked up with numbers people, data people, video people that can say, hey, by the way, did you know that X number of the goals that we allowed last season came from right here or right there or went in off of Mike Matheson's foot or whatever the case would be? And from there, they can determine how a defenseman should play a certain situation. What about when the puck goes back to the point? Do you really want the defenseman fronting the other team's player and maybe setting a double screen? Or do you want the defenseman to be proactive and move that guy out of there and really get everybody out of there, including Mike Matheson's foot? I'm going to say it again. I would love to see this approach, but it's got to work with the people that you have. And I'm going to throw one last example at you that might be of a concern in this regard, and that's if you have P.O. Joseph as your top-pairing defenseman, as I advocated on yesterday's opening segment, and you have Marcus Pedersen, you're talking about a couple of pretty wiry guys. Now, they can be irritants. They're not shy about getting engaged in anything, but they also don't necessarily have the beef to pull it off. And let's say you have certain defensemen who are better at fronting and others who are better at operating from behind. Maybe you even handle it individually. And you say to that guy, listen, we know that you're better at doing it this way. You're going to handle it like that. Or if you're someone like Chris Letang, who I haven't even mentioned here, but happens to be, I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad thing, the Penguins' best net front defenseman. He is, as one team executive recently described him to me, in this specific context, a real SOB. It's not something that you see probably uh, in watching the games on TV or casually, but if you're at a game, watch 58 in front of his own net. He's mean, okay? The Penguins need more of that. I'd love to see it happen in an aggressive way, but you got to work with what you have. When we come back, J1Q. Who asks, DK, this is a novice hockey question, but now that the Pens have solidified bringing back Sid, Gino, and Latang, is there hope that if the team is playoff bound next season, that maybe a lesson was learned and that they'll rest these guys more? John, I hope so. I, I brought this up late this past regular season, and I can tell you that I didn't get much of a reaction from. Listeners, I really didn't. I, I thought that this was going to be kind of a hot button thing. That maybe there'd be some strong feelings one way or the other about resting healthy players in the regular season when there's still some kind of positioning to be had. I thought this past season was the greatest possible opportunity to do it because if you'll recall, the entire Eastern Conference, the top eight were set like with three months to go. I mean, there were pipe dreams in Columbus and a couple other places, but not really. 
You know, <laughs> there wasn't any plausible path for any of those teams to overtake the eight that were above them. So from there, what you have to ask yourself as management of a team is what's more important to me, finishing third in the conference or fifth in the conference or entering the playoffs with everyone a thousand percent ready to go? And it blows my mind that this still hasn't made it to the NHL. And by that, I mean, of course, that it's made it to pretty much every other sport. The NFL is a little different because there's so few games and a lot of teams are qualifying on the last Sunday. But even those teams that do qualify in advance, they're not going to prioritize winning that last game over just resting almost everyone who matters. They just, you've seen them, they just put on hoodies on the sideline and just watch. The same now applies in Major League Baseball and in the NBA, which pioneered the concept, and smartly so. NBA, you know, you've got five starters, 82 games, same as hockey. Sit them down once in a while. Do it on the road. Don't tick off your own fans. If the Penguins are playing some early season games way out in there there's actually on the on the real schedule in October they go out to Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver and Seattle. And those games are split up on back-to-back nights meaning there's two in a row, then two days off, then two in a row. You know, get creative here. Be the pioneers, be the ones who buck the hockey trend. Hockey is just so stubborn with stuff like this. You remember when Sid was real close to getting to 82 games and he was like, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And they had the playoffs coming up and they also had this streak of not getting past the first round, which was a year younger at the time. And it was like, yeah, of course he's going to play. Of course he's going to play. And he goes out there and he plays and he plays like Sid, which means he goes all out. There's no other way. He didn't get hurt. He got lucky. The Penguins got lucky. But did he really enter the playoffs in the shape that you'd want, in the condition that you'd want. And what was the benefit of that? Look, I'm the furthest one from being some critic of Sid, but Sid is very much a product of the hockey culture, way more than he is any kind of pioneer. And there's never, ever going to be a player who feels comfortable going to the head coach or to the GM and saying, hey, you know what? I'd be a lot more effective In the playoffs, if I only played, let's say, oh, I don't know, 65 games, the players think it. I've talked to players behind the scenes, especially older guys, who will seize upon every break. And no, getting the practice off doesn't count. It helps. It's not the same thing. If the Penguins were to put forth an advance Schedule. Make it known to everybody. These are the games that Sid, Gino, and Latang are going to play. Oh, and, and Jeff Carter, too. Maybe Jeff Petrie. Throw in five of them and say, these guys are going to play a 65 to 70 game schedule. We're letting you know that in advance. And the reason we're letting you know that and the reason we're doing this is because we want to win a Stanley Cup. And we want to do absolutely everything that's within our power and injuries obviously aren't in anyone's control, but within our power to put them in the best possible position to succeed where we haven't been succeeding for about half a decade now. You tell me, who would complain about that? I mean, the players would, okay? But again, their votes don't count here. Who would complain? The only people I can think of would be the ones in Vancouver who would get, you know robbed of seeing Sid play, but they saw Sid score the golden goal in the Olympics, so they can live with that. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. 